Good morning, everybody. It's March 16th, 2020. I'm doing my typical daily lecture for our ICU team, and I've been seeing on social media some non palm grip folks, some non ICU folks are like, hey, I need a quick refresher on vents just in case. Uh, so join us for the next 15, 20 minutes while I talk to my team about the basics of vent management uh, in case uh, you're ever called upon uh, to help in the midst of this pandemic. This might be some useful information for you. All right, let's dive in. So vent management begins and ends in the alveolar capillary interface. This is where the action happens. We have two gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide, that need to transfer across the membrane. They need to jump onto RBCs that are swimming past in the capillary. Oxygen is typically only perfusion limited, meaning that in health, it can zip across this membrane and diffuse pretty quickly, typically in about the first third. When you go on a jog down this, the road, um, blood starts flowing faster past that capillary, and oxygen can keep up because it has plenty of extra distance to make the leap happen before it's gone past. In diseases that affect oxygenation, what happens is we start blocking this membrane, let's say like ARDS. So now, as the blood flows past, it becomes harder and harder for oxygen to diffuse across. Um, that's one concept that we're gonna revisit as we talk about our approaches to oxygenation. Carbon dioxide uh, also needs to get, obviously, across the membrane. And there are a couple different ways that we can enable uh, ventilation to improve. As a reminder, minute ventilation equals your respiratory rate times your tidal volume. We should also keep in mind in minute ventilation that when it comes to the tidal volume, we have this concept of alveolar ventilation. This is the ventilation that's actually happening at the alveolus. In alveolar ventilation, you're going to have the respiratory rate times the tidal volume minus the dead space. The dead space would be like the conducting airways and the airways that aren't participating in gas exchange. The alveolar ventilation is really what we're trying to impact when we talk about a CO2 transit and removal. There's a couple other concepts I want you to understand before we talk about the specific modes. Okay. When we talk about ventilators, we typically talk about mode, tidal volume, respiratory rate, PEEP, and FiO2. We're going to come to modes last. We're going to start with these other four because they enable us to impact O2 and CO2. Tidal volume and respiratory rate, as you would imagine, are the elements of minute ventilation. So these are the things that are going to affect CO2. PEEP and FiO2 are the things that are going to affect O2. We'll take the last one first, FiO2. If we put more oxygens in the alveolus, we're going to have more ability to get oxygen diffused across and jump it on hemoglobin. So by increasing the FiO2 from room air, which is 21%, as we go up and up and up, we have more ability to oxygenate. I think that's the most straightforward concept to understand. PEEP, positive end expiratory pressure. How does that work to improve oxygenation? PEEP works by telling the oxygens that are inside the alveolus to hang out and party a little bit longer. Here's what I mean. As air goes out on exhalation of the alveolus, the alveolus is going to shrink and you're going to lose some oxygen. Obviously, carbon dioxide is coming out as well. Typically, not much oxygen is left to diffuse across anymore. By adding PEEP, positive end expiratory pressure. What we do is we splint open that alveolus a little bit more. We tell some oxygens, hey guys, hang out at the party a little bit more. Party's not over. We want you to spend some more time diffusing across. By doing that, we give more time for oxygen to diffuse across, particularly when there's barriers to oxygenation. So by using PEEP as air is coming out of the lungs, we're providing a back pressure or a counter pressure to splint open airways and alveoli to afford more time for oxygen to diffuse. One downside of PEEP is that you can over PEEP it. You can give too much. As you look back at our cartoon up here, as we have this alveolus and it's getting bigger and bigger with more and more PEEP and staying open, it's going to crimp or squish the capillary more and more. As it squishes the capillary, what happens? the pressure backs up. 
As that pressure backs up, it can put a lot of strain on the right side of the heart. It can decrease preload, which can affect hemodynamics. So PEEP is something that you need to be mindful of. And typically, when you're dealing with patients like ARDS, there are charts that say something like, for a given FI2, you should have approximately this much amount of PEEP. As we've learned more and more in caring for patients on ventilators over the years, we've learned more about recruiting lung, about determining what the optimal level of PEEP is for a given FiO2, and we can do that by making calculations such as the driving pressure, which is the amount of pressure it's taking to push air into the lungs with each breath. Uh, that's a concept you could read about maybe some more on your own, how you uh, titrate driving pressure and look at driving pressure in patients with uh, advanced lung disease. All right, so to review, we've got the modes we're gonna get to, tidal bomb respiratory CO2, PEEP and FiO2 is how you improve oxygenation. Moment questions from my team? Questions right now? Okay, here's the next concept. When we are putting air into someone's chest um, to inflate the lungs, we want to determine what the pressures are inside the chest so we don't overdo it. We know from ventilating patients that if we give too big a tidal volumes, thought to be greater than eight cc's per kilo uh, predicted body weight, we could overstretch the alveoli, drawing a really big alveolus, and overstretched alveoli are not happy. They lead to hemodynamic instability, like I mentioned, but also barotrauma, pneumothorax, cytokine release, and such from overstretch. So we don't want to give too big a tidal volume. We also don't want to push too hard on the alveoli and stretch them too hard, because it can also cause barotrauma and volutrauma. One of the key numbers we look for when we're ventilating uh, patients is something called the plateau pressure, or P-plat. P-plat is the end inspiratory pressure. So this is the pressure at the end of inhalation, when the lungs are full. So if you all take a breath in right now and hold it, that's kind of your plateau pressure. It's a measure of the compliance of the lungs, the stretchability, as it were, of the lungs. Typically, our goal is to keep P-plat pressures less than about 30. We're happy with that. There's some times when we allow P-plats to climb above 30. Um, these include cases of morbid obesity, that kind of thing, where you have a counter pressure pushing back up on the thorax. But for the most part, one of the things we're looking for to know that we're safely ventilating patients is the P-plat, which is the end inspiratory pressure. Another pressure to become familiar with on ventilators is the peak pressure, P-E-A-K. The peak pressure is going to be the highest pressure that the ventilator records as air is going into the patient. Here's the concept you need to understand. The peak pressure is always the highest pressure, so if the plateau pressure rises, the peak pressure will also rise. They rise together. But there are other things that can cause the peak pressure to rise that don't necessarily involve the plateau pressure rising. Let me explain. If you had somebody who wasn't deeply sedated and they had this breathing tube in their mouth and they crunch on it, there's gonna be a lot of resistance to airflow as the air starts to move through the tube. That will instantly increase the peak pressures. But once the air gets down into the lungs, the compliance, assuming they have normal lungs, is fine. So their plateau pressures are nice and low. Another example might be if you had the endotracheal tube kink, or you had a mucus plug in the tube, or if you had a disease that affects large airways, such as asthma and status asthmaticus, you might see high peak pressures but low plateau pressures. Once the air gets in, we're fine. On the flip, things that would elevate the plateau pressure would include things like ARDS, a big pneumothorax, uh, obesity with the belly and abdominal contents pushing up against the thorax, uh, pulmonary edema, anything that affects stretchability, fibrosis of the lungs, would elevate the plateau and correspondingly the peak. The plateau, especially this number 30 in ARDS, is one of the key metrics we often aim to achieve to make sure we're safely ventilating these patients. In ARDS specifically, we keep tidal volumes low, six mils per kilo predicted body weight. Remember that in ARDS, uh, your lungs don't increase in size as your body habitus increases. Your lung size is based on your height. That's why it's predicted body weight in that calculation and we try to keep the plateaus under 30. 
A moment for questions before we move to modes. Okay, so I'm going to come over here, we're going to do the mode, um, we're going to go ACVC, ACVC plus, pressure control or ACPC, SIMV we'll touch on briefly, then we're going to do volume support, CPAP pressure support. To give context over here, we use ACVC and this may vary from hospital to hospital around the country, uh, but here, the hosp most, for the most part of our hospitals, we, we only use ACVC about 1% of the time. We use ACVC plus like 92% of the time. I'm just pulling these numbers out. We use pressure control maybe about 5% of the time, and SIMV 1% to 2% of the time. These modes up here that I separated with the line, these all involve setting a rate on the vent. So in addition to the mode, you're going to set a rate. The next two, volume support and CPAP pressure support, these are called spontaneous modes. In rate set modes, the patient triggers a breath and the ventilator gives them a breath. In spontaneous modes, the ventilator does not trigger a breath if the patient um, does not want a breath. So in spontaneous modes, let's say if the patient received a paralytic, no breaths are going in the patient. In these modes with the rate, if the patient receives a paralytic, they'll at least, at the very minimum, get the rate that you've set. All right, so we'll start with ACVC. I'll do my best to, uh, I'm not intending to draw these uh, cartoons the exact way it's gonna look on the ventilator waveform. I'm intending to talk about conceptually how they work for your level and for the level of people that uh, might not have done foam crit training. So in ACVC, you set a rate. Let's say for the sake of uh, our examples here, the rate is set at 10. You set a tidal volume. Let's say, for example, the tidal volume is 500. If the patient is paralyzed, they're gonna get 10 breaths a minute at 500 cc's. If the patient takes an extra breath because they're not paralyzed, breath number, let's say 11, they're gonna get 500. If they take 33 breaths a minute, they're gonna get 33 breaths a minute at 500 cc's. So you can quickly see how somebody could develop, say, a respiratory alkalosis if they're really anxious or in a lot of pain and they have a high respiratory rate. 